Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We all know that smoking cigarettes is lethal to your health. And in fact, societal pressures have made smoking taboo. So why is it that cigarette ads targeted to the African-American community have actually increased and cigarette companies are spending more of their marketing dollars supporting African-American events? Is there a mixed message to the black community? On this edition of Another View on Health, we're talking Talking about smoking. Cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby and I will be right back after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. And good Friday afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Just want the opportunity to uh, talk to you about a couple of things before we get into our discussion today on uh, smoking and um, the tobacco companies. And it's going to be a really interesting discussion, so I hope you stay with us. Just wanted to mention that I had the privilege of attending last night the Hope Gala for the Salvation Army, the opening celebration for the Croc Center, which is in in the um, Broad Creek section of Norfolk. If you get an opportunity, please go over, please visit. It is a wonderful, wonderful facility, and I think it will do a lot for all of Hampton Roads. Um, a beautiful pool area and workout rooms and meeting rooms and a gorgeous theater there. So a lot of things happening, and um, a lot of people put a lot of money and a lot of time and love and energy into putting it together. So that was a wonderful event last night. Also, I want to invite you all tonight to join me here at WHRO for the YWCA Southampton Roads Stand Together Against Racism event. Now, once a year, the YWCA um, chapters all over the country come together to talk about ways that we can all learn to get along and to stand together against racism. It is tonight from 6 to 7.30 p.m. right here at WHRO. We're located at 5200 Hampton Boulevard in Norfolk and we're going to be talking about stand your ground and state your opinion. So we hope that you will come out and uh, share with us this afternoon. And then finally, I just want to invite you this evening at 9 o'clock, uh, Malik Hawkins, who is a young actor from our area who you first found out about here on Another View. Uh, he is debuting in Tim Reed's movie, Troop 491 The Adventures of the Muddy Lions. It debuts on TV tonight. It's a national TV premiere at 9 o'clock on the Up channel, which is Up TV, which is all about um, making sure that you see positive uh, television. That's located on Cox, uh, can, chan, mm, Cox Cable, channel 242. So, lots of things happening in this area. Uh, we were working on a couple of audio issues, so I think we're all together now, and that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Probably one of the most effective health campaigns in terms of awareness is the danger of cigarette smoking. We are now well aware that smoking is a major factor in developing cancer and cardiovascular disease, which are also the leading causes of death in the African-American community. So armed with this information, why is it that the deaths from smoking-related illnesses are significantly higher among African Americans despite the fact that African Americans typically smoke fewer cigarettes a day and start smoking at a later age than whites? And then here's another question. Why do more than 75% of African American smokers smoke menthol cigarettes compared to 23% of white smokers? And why is the quit rate among African Americans at 35% while more than 50% of whites are able to quit? Lots of questions for our Another View on Health experts today. Please welcome my ho co-host, cardiologist, Dr. Keith Newby. Hi, Dr. Newby. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great today. Yeah, I was wondering. I thought with his, <laughs> with his headset not working, I thought you was trying to tell me you wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> no, I don't okay. want to get rid of you. So I'm glad we got things straightened out. <laughs> Ms. Frida Bryan, she is a community health advisor Associate Director with the American Cancer Society. Hi, Frida. Hi, Barbara. 
So good to, good to have you with us <laughs> Thank today. Thank you for having me. And joining me by phone is Del Monte Jefferson, Executive Director of the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network. Hi, Del Monte. How you doing? Hello. How are you? Doing good. That's fantastic. Right. So I want to start by talking about, um, actually, I want to read you a quote. And this quote comes from an R.J. Reynolds tobacco company executive. Now, he was quoted in the London Times, I'm sorry, the Times of London on August 2nd, 1992. And let me give you the context. Dave Gorlitz, R.J. Reynolds lead Winston model. So he was the gentleman who was the model in all the ads for Winston cigarettes, um, was talking about what this executive said to him when he asked the executive how come he didn't smoke okay and he said we don't smoke that expletive we just sell it we reserve the right to smoke for the young the poor the black and stupid strong statement mm. strong statement what do you think about that doctor definitely Newby. accurate uh, you know just look at any um uh addictive substance uh you hear drug dealers that want to keep you know cocaine or crack in the african-american community because they figure people that are of low maybe of low economic means you say keep in these neighborhoods these are the folks that are going to buy it more likely they're trying to escape the reality and uh you know you get them addicted and people stay on it mm -hmm. so i think a lot of this is just based on the addictive process of this stuff frida I agree. I think it's unfortunate that a um, company of that magnitude is willing to say we're targeting and making a deliberate target towards the economic less, the less education and saying a specific community. I think it's an, an opportunity again for us as African-Americans to say enough is enough. We're not going to stand for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that means that we do not buy those products and we have a uh, powerful economic power if we if we do that if we make that decision but um like doctor said is addictive it's it's not something psychological it's a physical addiction and it's going to take um a deliberate action on mm -hmm. our part but del monte there's another um uh, element to this and that is the whole idea of targeting not only just cigarettes but menthol cigarettes to the black community tell talk to us a little bit about why that makes a difference well, that makes a difference, um, especially when you talk about the tobacco industry and, and the predatory marketing tactics that they have. Um, they disproportionately market uh, candy-flavored poison, and that's what menthol is, is candy-flavored poison to African-Americans and other, other communities. Um, uh, Hispanics smoke at also higher rates than whites, and American Indians also smoke at higher rates than whites. And, and these they're targeted by these mentholated tobacco products, and it really is discriminatory, and it's genocidal. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does, what does the, the menthol do? I mean, it does something else to the body, well, in addition to the nicotine, right? Yeah, well, all these components of cigarettes, um, you know, part of the is, issue is the addiction, of course, to the nicotine, but the additives are also, um, it's like the tar, or the menthol, all that stuff has, they're like poisons, like he was saying uh, earlier. And so they have their negative effects as it relates to vascular disease, you know, cancer rates, COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease. So it's, it's damaging. It's really literally is a poison and it does damage the body from multiple aspects. There are three ways, apparently, um, in, in the research that I've done that um, tobacco companies have been really focusing on the African-American community, and that is through targeted advertising, targeted products, and targeted philanthropy. So, Damonte, I want to ask you about this whole idea of targeted advertising. I mean, why, first of all, why is that happening? And then secondly, why is not the African-American community totally up in arms about it? Well, um, why it's happening, uh, I think, again, the very nature of a predator is to target someone who is more less informed, um, has fewer resources uh, than they may have, and so that's why they target the African American uh, communities. Now, now, why aren't African Americans doing anything about it? That second part of the question, and 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 this targeting is not something new. They didn't just start doing this, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if you all remember the Cool Mix campaign that happened. Back in the 90s, I, I don't know if you remember the Uptown Cigarettes and the X campaign when they tried to come out with 
specific brands of cigarettes, one called Uptown in Philadelphia, uh, that they tried to market. And, and the community came out and stopped that, along with um, um, Health and Human Services Secretary at that time, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. Uh, they said no, and the, and the community stopped that. And with the X brand, um, they were trying to prey on Malcolm X, and it was red, black, and green. And, and so, But the communities, you know, they stopped that as well. So uh, the community has been involved. However, uh, you're talking about an industry with billions of dollars, mm-hmm. and, and so you you have to have significant information in these grassroots campaign. And right now, for uh, unfortunately, there's just not enough resources to really combat the industry. I was talking to uh, one of my colleagues here at uh, WHRO who is not African American, and we we actually did a little mini experiment in my office where we took um, a couple of magazines geared to the African American community. Ebony was was uh, the specific magazine, and we just started flipping through because her response was, "I can't remember the last time I saw." an ad that that promoted cigarettes Mm -hmm. and we started flipping through several editions of ebony and there was salem's cools Mm -hmm. and newports (laughs) (laughs) you know and so um and there's a stat that i found that that actually it is higher for um there are more messages messaging that go to uh black publications than say for people magazine for example i mean it's like nine times more often you will see an ad uh in an african-american uh, publication versus um, a a general publication, and I guess the other question I have in Del Monte, I'll start with you. So a lot of times these tobacco company prof, um, uh, the money that these black publications make keeps them alive. It keeps them alive, and now the relationship here, Barbara, the, it, it's complicated. There was a movie mm-hmm. out called "This Complicated." Because this goes back a long, long time. You know, when, when African Americans, when Africans first came to this country, they didn't come to pick cotton; they came to pick tobacco, and that's what they majority. That's that was the majority of the crops that they worked on uh, was tobacco. Mm-hmm. Um, cotton came later, but tobacco was first. Um, when African Americans were freed after slavery ended, one of the first industries to hire. African Americans in executive positions was the tobacco industry, and so you go to North Carolina at um, uh, R.J. Reynolds. That company had more black executives than than you had anywhere else in the country working for the tobacco industry, and so you had them hiring African Americans as executives. You had them supporting our communities, church functions, the Cool Mix Jazz Festival. I mean, the Cool Jazz Festival. I don't even know how long that goes back. You know that they mm-hmm. sponsored that in Chicago. Our universities, um, our institutions, they help build several of them. And so there is a relationship there that goes back, you know, hundreds of years. And so at at least 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're dealing with. And so when I say it's complicated, um, trying to divest from that level of of commitment from the industry, it's it's kind of hard, mm-hmm. and, it, and it would be somewhat, you know, we really have to come up with a plan if we're going to help these uh, our institutions divest from the industry. Mm-hmm. So for, then, Frida, how do we get the other message out? Because if if in the advertising um, and in our publications you're seeing ads for cigarettes, then mm-hmm. it's kind of hard for them to also run. A an article or an ad that says "Don't smoke." Don't smoke because it causes <laughs> because, cancer. <laughs> because you're 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 going directly against your advertiser, mm-hmm. and, and we all know that's that's a difficult place to be. Well, um, first, I think it's an interesting aspect that in the African American community, the black men have a higher prevalence of smoking, twenty two percent, whereas the black women have the lowest among the lowest so our black women have cut back on smoking Mm -hmm. and it's interesting when you were looking in in the ebony magazine i would say that we mostly have women readers on that particular magazine so what we try to do from the american cancer society perspective is not just education and awareness but also from the legislative aspect i mean there have been some states that have put higher taxes on cigarettes to try to deter um I want to applaud CVS, the uh, drugstore, for making that phenomenal move and say, we are not going to sell tobacco products. We are hoping that the other drugstore chains follow suit, but we can't mandate it. And you, you, you don't necessarily want to put a, a scare tactic, but it is what it is. Smoking causes cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, And why the mortality rate is higher in our community, one of the factors is 
we catch it late. You know, we do now have a test where heavy smokers at risk can get a certain screening. But really, when that patient comes into the office from that chronic cough, that cold, those symptoms, you know, by that time, it may be later stages, which then reduces the survival risk. Mm -hmm. But we keep pushing the message on the awareness and the change and actually hoping that our legislators come on board with that Mm -hmm. and the companies, um, whether it's, you know, not reaching out to the young kids, um, individual cities have healthy coalitions that are helping with that. You know, when we talk about the mom and pop stores, um, not, you know, uh, um, Del Monte, you had alluded to the fact that when we say we're not going to shop here anymore, mm-hmm. you know, because you're doing that, I think that would be a very powerful statement. That's what we need to and do. And you, you bring up the mom and pop stores. and There's a 2011 study of cigarette prices in retail stores across the U.S. found that Newport cigarettes are significantly less expensive in neighborhoods with higher proportions of African-Americans. So, you know, we're back to the whole when we talk about the food desert, when we talk about the convenience store being the place for everything. I mean, I want I hope our our listeners next time you walk into a convenience store pay attention and look around and see what's being advertised mm. dr newby well i think like anything else um you know when, when you're targeted you know they're going to try to make it convenient for you to buy it you know so they make these cheaper you're going to buy it more and uh, that's really what it boils down to but what the problem becomes is once the addiction starts you know then you know the, it, it just becomes an issue because they can't get rid of them. I mean, and I'm going to tell you, I've had patients literally will make this comment to me. I've had people that have tested all forms of drugs and have been addicted on cocaine, they've been heroin, and they've told me they have a harder time getting rid of cigarettes than they did heroin. Wow. And now, I mean, now you talk about a powerful statement. I mean, and I've heard that several times. They can't get rid of co- they can get rid of cocaine. So I tried that for a while, no big deal. But cigarettes, I can't I can't give them up. There are some people that, you know, can just cold turkey stop, but that's not often, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's the problem. Once this starts, you know, this addiction starts and I talk to young people, why are you smoking? You know, above everybody else, you know, older individuals didn't have the knowledge base, the understanding. I mean, it was cool to smoke back then because that was, uh, you know, a status thing. Now we know what this stuff causes. Why are you doing this? But they still say the same thing because. I want to look cool. I say, well, why don't you do something else? <laughs> Find another way to do that. But uh, this is this is a real problem. I mean, and we'll talk as we go along about the, all the health concerns because sure. yeah, the cancer totally. thing is important, you know. But I'm gonna tell you, smoking causes a multitude of medical issues that you know they talk about this the health care um, issue and the cost of that. I mean, you know how much smoking <laughs> causes. I mean, the actual cost of health care. You know, all well, anyway, we're talking about as we go along. <laughs> passionate time, passionate and, and time. Absolutely. And Del Monte, I mean, I know that your organization, um, the um, National African American Tobacco Prevention Network, you're about prevention messaging also. So what are you all doing? We're about prevention messaging, I think, but uh, we are also doing just what Fred had said earlier, and that is trying to get policy changes impacted. Um, mm-hmm. we, we can do the message all day long. But we've got to have restrictions on places where these mentholated tobacco products uh, are sold or if they are allowed to be sold at all. We've got to have that in place. Uh, We helped. We were there uh, in Chicago uh, when um, Mayor Rahm Emanuel um, passed that historic legislation, by the way, the 500-foot rule around uh, where mentholated tobacco products can be sold around a a Chicago public school. That that Mm -hmm. was historic. I mean, it was... It was the first time that a city or county had taken some action on the menthol. Don't forget, the FDA did not um, take that lead on that. They had an opportunity, um, but they have yet to take the lead on that uh, in terms of banning methylated tobacco. But um, uh, a city did, and we were there. We were supporting them. Um, We had partners of ours with the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, Dr. Phil Gardner. He testified, Dr. Valerie Yerger, Carol Magruder. They stood before the uh, Chicago City Council, uh, mm-hmm. and, and they testified on, as to how a mentholated tobacco um, products prey on youth. And so, you now we're there, and we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to try and take that model across other cities and communities until such day that the FDA takes and utilizes their authority to regulate this product 
we will work with communities and with cities to, to enact those, these bans. Mm-hmm. as we did in Chicago. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. We're talking about smoking and we're talking about targeting the African-American community through ads and um, and through uh, philanthropy and so forth and also the health risks. We want to try to encourage you not to smoke. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 Carl joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Carl. You're on the air. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yes, we're here. You're on the air. Yeah. I. You were talking about targeting. I attended a historical black college, uh, Allen University in South Carolina, and they forbid the use of uh, tobacco on their campus. Of course, I'm 80, and this was during the er, mid to early 50s. But that's one way of saying. This is not good for our children. This is not good for our people. And we don't have to attack the companies. The various organizations that guide our youth can do it. And our sororities and fraternities. Okay, Carl. Thanks for your call. I mean, to Carl, Carl's point, go ahead. Let me, can I comment today? Yes, yeah, sure. I'm absolutely. Glad you brought that up because um, we are working with a, a group of partners, Legacy Foundation, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, Louisiana Public Health Institute, and what we are trying to do is encourage all of the HBCUs to adopt a 100% tobacco-free policy. And so we are, we're working on that. We just completed a, uh, a survey. Uh, some students from Morehouse completed a survey of the different HBCUs to determine what the policies are. And so we're supposed to be meeting in, uh, in, in late May uh, with a steering committee to try and establish a plan for how we're going to attack this. Um, former Surgeon General Regina Benjamin is going to be our spokesperson chair. And so we're excited about that. But he's got a point, and, and we're heading in that direction. So what's the response from the, from the HBCUs? I mean, do they see it as a critical um, issue to deal with? Well, some of them already have policies established. Um, not, not some of it is because if they're part of the state uh, institutions, then, of course, you know, when the state said all of our colleges are going to go tobacco-free, then those that are part of that fell underneath that venue. But mm-hmm. take Southern University, for example. They had five campuses that they went out and decided that this was the policy that they wanted. And in conjunction, the Louisiana Public Health Institute helped them um, to move that campaign forward. But they adopted that policy themselves. And so we're finding as these surveys are coming back that they've already got policies. Um, we're just trying to make sure and help them to enforce the policy. Mm-hmm. Because let's not forget, uh, the HBCUs sit, um, most of them at least, they sit in communities that are disparate in themselves. In mm-hmm. themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's those communities where they have to go outside and do a lot of shopping. And it's, it's those communities where you're going to see the advertisements plastered all over the windows uh, for these little convenience stores advertising new ports and cools and the buy one, get one free and, and the price being lower than it would be in other places. And so, yeah, the HBCU may adopt their policy, but once they go outside of that campus into that community, <laughs> bam. Yeah, it's, all it's over right the there, all over, all over again. Dr. Newby, talk to us about some of the other diseases. I mean, you know, you think cigarettes, you automatically think cancer, you think lung cancer. Um, mm-hmm. But talk to us about some of the other things that happen to you when you smoke. Uh, one of the um, couple of big things is vascular disease. Um, when you look at the uh, number of risk factors, we talk about people that develop coronary disease, stroke. Peripheral vascular disease is always going to be the following, you know, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cholesterol issues, family history. And then the fifth one that always comes up is smoking. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's one of the major risk factors. You look at people that have vascular disease, like peripheral vascular disease, when they have blockages in their legs. If you look at the two biggest risk factors for that group of people, it's going to be tobacco use and diabetes. You know, so the one of the issues that happens in the African-American community, which, which we brought up in several shows before, the other disease processes, you know, they're additive. So, mm-hmm. you know, we have a lot of our people that have diabetes. We have a lot of our people that have hypertension. So if you add smoking on top of that, it's like a triple whammy. You know, then you talk about cholesterol issues because it's all that they all interplay on each other. Mm-hmm. If you have diabetes, more than not, you're probably going to have cholesterol problems. More than not, you're going to develop hypertension. So I think what happens with, with especially in, in, in our community is that we, we have the tobacco use that comes in play, but 
more importantly, we have these other medical conditions that do lead to vascular disease, lung uh, disease. You talk about COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease. Over time, you'll, you'll find probably more than not there will be some form of lung issues other than cancer that, get, that come about, mm-hmm. emphysema, uh, you know, which is a big thing. You know, again, these are slow processes that take people away from here. This is stuff that's not like an acute, you know, strokes can be acute, heart attack can be acute, but you talk about lung problems, that's a gradual problem. It gradually gets worse, and then by the time it gets really bad, that's when the healthcare dollars start to rise because of the chronic treatment. Home oxygen, uh, you know about the ho- multiple hospitalizations, you know, the chronic lung, like the bronchodilators, all the inhalers that have to be used. Mm-hmm. All this stuff goes into, you know, the ultimate cost that it takes to take care of people with all this. If you're just joining us, we're talking about African-Americans and smoking with my co-host, cardiologist, Dr. Keith Newby, Ms. Frida Bryan, Community Health Advisor, Associate Director with the American Cancer Society, and Mr. Delmonte Jefferson, Executive Director of the National African-American Tobacco Prevention Network. We want to talk with now with a woman by the name of Gloria McCain and she is a former smoker and she developed lung disease. Uh, Ms. McCain, how are you? I'm super. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Could you tell us about your about what happened to you? First of all, how old were you when you started smoking? Um, to my better knowledge, I think I was like maybe 15 or 16. Mm-hmm. And how long did you smoke? Well, on and off, you know, once you got caught by your parents, you backed up, <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then you wanted to be with what? <clears throat> excuse me. You wanted to be with what is called the in crowd, so you were like sitting around and you would do a puff or two every now and then. But by the time you got home, you would think that your system was clean or clear, and that was not the answer. Mm-hmm. You automatically was hooked, and cigarette smoking became a big problem. Now, you developed lung cancer, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, okay. I did. And do, do you blame that um, specifically on the cigarette smoking? I blame it specifically on me. Hmm. Being not knowledgeable to know that cigarettes was one of the main issues that could get me where I am today. Mm-hmm. And how are you doing today? I'm, I'm having um, what is called a tearful day today. Any mm-hmm. little thing... If I see something sad on TV, I want to cry. You know, I'm having a mood swing day to day. Mm-hmm. But it's not. At least I can thank God and say it's not painful today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what would you want to tell people who um, currently smoke who are having trouble quitting? Put them away. Put them in a flush them in a toilet. Do away with it. Mm-hmm. Don't trade places with the devil. It's not a happy media. If you have a cigarette now, break it up, put it out. When you get up in the morning and your body can't tell you whether you're going to get up and go in the kitchen and eat or whether you even can get up, Hmm. this is where the problem come in. You can't help anybody because you can't help yourself. Hmm. These are things that happen. If you have beautiful grandchildren, You can't get up and help them in the morning because you can't help yourself. All of this is the result of cigarette smoking Mm -hmm. in your lungs. Your lungs are a very important part of your body. It keeps you breathing. But if you don't want to breathe and you don't want to keep on breathing, you don't want to do for your husband, your wife, your daughter, your granddaughter, your grandson, your aunt, your uncle. Mm. Yeah, no, if you don't want to do for those people, then go ahead, be my guest. Would you like for me to buy you a pack? <laughs> Ms. McCain, we wish you the very best of luck. We are we are happy. We're sad that you're having a tearful day today, but the fact is that you're you're fighting this disease and you're with us, and so we really appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us here on another view today. Absolutely. All right, you take care now, Frida. She talks about a teary day. Oh my goodness! And I uh, talked with Miss Gloria just day before yesterday, and Miss Gloria, I hope you're still listening. And let me remind you that you are a walking, talking 
walking, breathing, living miracle. And it is natural for us to have those days from time to time. And I recall you telling me about your grandson. Um, just, you know, you have, it's been a year now for her. So um, a lot of people expect us to get back to normal when it's not the old normal, it's a new normal. Um, with our issues, our long-term side effects from the chemo and the radiation and the surgery. Miss Gloria, and, you just hang in there, sweetie. And I want to tell our audience, too, in case they're not aware, Frida, you are a, a cancer survivor and thriver, as, I am. as you like to say, <laughs> um, and, and have been fighting this disease for a long time. For 12 years now, I was originally diagnosed in 2002 and with breast cancer, chemo, radiation, surgeries, was in remission for five years. And in 2007, I was re-diagnosed with stage four metastatic mm -hmm. disease. So mm -hmm. I am living despite the prognosis, despite the diagnosis, but living with metastatic cancer since uh, the re-diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Were you a uh, smoker? No. I was not a smoker. However, when I was going through air traffic control school in the Navy, our weather class that was for a week, I could not stay awake. And because I was young and naive, someone said, you know, if you smoke, um, it helps you. And my mother and father smoked most of my life. You know, we can talk about the secondhand smoke. I tried one cigarette and it was a more. <laughs> and I vomited the rest of the afternoon <laughs> and I said, I got to try something else. <laughs> so I, you know, did not pick up that habit despite at that time you could smoke in government buildings, you know, in radar rooms and control towers. We were around it a lot, but I never took up the habit, even though I had been around smoke all my life from my mother and father, mm -hmm. um, but never did take up that um, habit. 440-2665 mm -hmm. or 1-800-940-2240. Geraldine joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Geraldine. You're on the air. Oh, hi. 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 I'm a big fan of yours, and I love you for your sense of humanity. Thank you. You just bring quality, whatever you do. Thank you. You're welcome. Um I happen to pick up a magazine. Um, my son is 11, and he gets uh, Popular Science. I was surprised at how littered Popular Science is with cigarette ads. There are at least four. I don't know if you categorize school in that category, but this is a periodical that's supposed to educate, and it's got cigarette ads. And I must say, the African-American people look very robust and healthy and cool. There's a man with a cigarette playing piano. It is marketed to everybody. It's terrible. But I would like to ask a question after I made my tirade, and my question would be, <laughs> are we going to find out in a few years that e-cigarettes are dangerous? Is there any real research out there that suggests Yes, this is a, a, a reasonable solution to someone's habit. I, I'm just I'm just curious. Okay. Uh, Delmonte, you want to have, try that first? Well, just yesterday, the FDA um, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, and uh, what that said was that they plan to regulate e-cigarettes just like they do other cigarette products. And so they've got an open comment period that's going to come up, and they're going to get comments from uh, public health folks, as well as comments from the industry as to why they should or should not regulate e-cigarettes. And I do think that uh, if this goes forward, and, and even though there's some time, there's some time to come from this thing because these things take some time. You know, from the period that they get comments and then make a decision it takes forever. Um, but if they do regulate these e-cigarettes, then we're not going to have this problem. We hope that we're not going to have this problem like we have with regular tobacco products. We don't want to go down that road. We don't want in terms of the science behind it right now, mm -hmm. um, you've got two camps. One camp saying, yes, it can help. Uh, another camp saying, no, we don't want to renormalize cigarette smoking. And so you've got public health folks actually on both sides of the aisle um, for e-cigarettes. Um, but with the FDA stepping in and saying, we are going to regulate this and, 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 and getting some comments as to how they should do it or when they should do it, I think that's going to be helpful and that's going to help us out. And, you know, it, to, to piggyback on Geraldine's statement about the African-Americans in the ad looking happy, according to the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, um, contrary to how blacks are typically portrayed in the media, cigarette ads portray images of African-Americans who are happy, confident, successful, wealthy, in love, attractive, strong, and independent, Keith. <laughs> I 
I told you, they, 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 that's that target. They want to make sure it looks like if you if you smoke, it's like I, I used to joke. My my wife and I were talking. I was telling this funny story when I was a kid. This advertisement came. I think I was four years old about uh, these tennis shoes called PF Flyers. I never forget. Oh, that. I don't I know if you remember. To, those. I used to wear PF Flyers. Well, you know, they used to, you know, I used to laugh because they had this ad that said that PF Flyers would make you run faster, jump higher. So I, I taught my mom to buy me these shoes, and I went out in the backyard and said I was going to jump over the picnic table. <laughs> Got halfway there, bam! <laughs> I went to my mom. I said, "Mom, these shoes don't work." So, <laughs> so you say all that to say that if if you know if you advertise it that way, and it's, it, you say, "Okay," it's, it's like getting your mind to say, "This is what I should do because mm-hmm. I want to be like these people I'm seeing on these ads." Mm-hmm. So well, I mean, but, and, but let's let's just throw this in also. Mm-hmm. It is just absolutely the opposite. The more educated you are, and this is just not for African Americans, this goes across the board, but mm-hmm. the more educated you are, the less likely you are to smoke. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that's the more true. The less successful you are, the less likely you are to smoke. Oh, and so <laughs> the reality of it is just the opposite of what they're portraying in the ad. Oh, yeah, but just hmm. think about who is targeting. It's targeting those people that are not there now. Yeah. You know, so that, and that's what, that's what really drives So it there. makes them think that if yeah. I smoke, I can, get, I can there. get there. I can right. get to yeah. that point. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Give us a call. Um, are you having trouble stopping smoking? Let's talk about that. Keith joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Keith. You're on the air. Hello. Hello? Keith, can you turn your radio down, please? And you're on the okay. air. Okay. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah. How you doing? Okay. I'd like to, I'd like to point out that um, years ago, they mentioned that um, it took Afro-Americans longer to kick the habit of smoking cigarettes as well as marijuana. And um, you look what's going on with uh, marijuana legal, legalization, and not to mention that I've seen in a lot of the magazine ads um, increased ads by alcohol. So this is this has, has some serious issues out there to deal with. Okay. Thanks so much for your call, Keith. Frida, you want to react? Well, um, I want to uh, bring note to an ad that American Cancer Society had, and it was a, a Caucasian woman who had cancer, and she literally showed what the face of cancer was, and she had lost her voice box, taken you know taken off her wig and she ultimately did pass away from uh, lung cancer but i think with those type of ads versus the this is very glamorization you're cool Mm -hmm. you're coming off a jet plane and you know all of this that when we really do look at the face and there's another particular one that's running targeting towards the kids i don't know if you've seen it where Mm -hmm. Um, it's portrayed as, okay, give me your money. You know, when you're going to stop watching TV when I tell you to stop because it was talking about the, the addiction aspect of it. And gotcha. the cigarette was uh, kind of a dirty, you know, nasty man. And, you know, it, it was saying to the kids, I can make you do this. Um, so mm-hmm. when we need, we just need to be very deliberate in, in what we do. And, and I'll also say that uh, the Portsmouth Redevelopment and Housing last year went smokeless. Mm-hmm. They took a huge stand in the area to say, if you live in our housing authority, you're not going to be able to smoke in the homes. But and actually, I'm a, a uh, commissioner on the Norfolk Redevelopment okay. Housing Board, and that is a discussion that we're having um, uh, and starting to have with our residents also to um, to go smoke free. So it's a it's a very people become really passionate about it, don't they, Keith? Oh, very much so. Yeah, one of the things that you. Um, I think should be brought up as this issue of, uh, you know, and it's going to come back quickly to a health issue. Mm -hmm. Um, Commented the young lady that was on the phone earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, a lot of people think, okay, you know, when I talk to them about smoking in the office and they'll say, you know, I've cut back, I'm only smoking like four cigarettes a day. And I mean, they're just happy go lucky. And I I really applaud the efforts because they were smoking a pack a day and they're down to four cigarettes a day. I mean, I'm giving them all the credit in the world, but I also try to tell them, I said, listen, don't think you're out of the woods, though. Mm -hmm. Because really, if you look at some prior data that says you smoke one cigarette a week, that's enough to accelerate your risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is is there a point of no return in in the the sense of, You've been smoking for so long that it's just not going to make a difference. No, or, that's not true. Okay, so you can you can always yep. improve your health yeah, they, if you stop. They say that if you stop smoking, but within, I forget the number of years that you can actually, it, you know, I mean, there is a point of no return in certain situations, but mm-hmm. generally speaking, 
if you stop smoking, they say within the X number of years, your lungs will actually recover, recover from you know, yeah, from whatever that is. Now, again, that's, I can't say it in everybody, but there is strong data that says it will recover to the point like you've never smoked at all. Now, you know, so you'll get somebody that, you know, they'll say like they stopped smoking and six months later, they say, oh, I found I had cancer. I should have just kept smoking. I'm like, but mm -hmm. that was, that cancer was there six months ago. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I try to tell me if you continue to smoke, all you're going to do is accelerate the possibility mm -hmm. that that will take you away from here. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Latif joins us from Hampton. Hi, Latif. You're on the air. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I am a smoking cessation facilitator, and I would challenge all smokers to look at the ingredients, go online and look at the ingredients in Salem, Newport, and Cool, which are traditional African-American cigarettes. They have more tar and more nicotine than any other filtered cigarette on the market. I just wanted to make that point. I'll take your comment off the air. Okay, Latif, before you go, what are, what are some of the things you hear from people in terms of the difficulty that they have quitting? Well, it's extremely difficult because nicotine is more addictive than heroin. And I just don't think people realize what, um, what they were doing when they started smoking. It's just extremely, extremely difficult. I've heard people also say that they stopped smoking and they gained weight, so they mm -hmm. went back smoking so they could lose weight. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say that. And it, Well, in order to stop smoking, you need support, you need help, medical intervention, the patch, the gum, or some other kind of medication, you need counseling. And there are some groups out there I would uh, also want to put out there that you can call the 1-800-QUIT-NOW uh, number. That's the support service, and uh, you really need help. You need, you need an intervention because if people could stop on their own, they would They would it. stop. Most Absolutely. Can. Thank you so much, Lizzie, for joining us. We really appreciate your uh, call. Agna joins us now from Virginia Beach. Hi, Agna. Hello. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love this show. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I um, also remember P.F. Flyers, by the way, like your further <laughs> guests, and I thought they were going to make me fly, so that didn't work, and... Um, I have to tell you, smart water doesn't work either. <laughs> we only have a few minutes left. What's your question okay. for us? Uh, my father uh, smoked for ages and ages. He died of colon cancer. I wondered if uh, one of you guests could mention uh, something about colon cancer connected to smoking. Um, and my brother and I have both had, can had cancer, um, possibly as a result of second cancer, because mm -hmm. neither of us smoked at all. Okay. And I'll take the comments off the air. Thank you. Thank you, Agna. Thank you for calling. Frida? Um, well, of course, smoking is a risk factor for all of the cancers, you know, and, and for colon, breast. So what we try to talk about is reducing those. Now, as far as um, I think maybe Agna was asking about the possibility of genetics, um, that her father had cancer, that is a possibility with any of the cancer sites. And, and we do encourage um, all people to know when you're to get that screening at what age you know um, colon cancer if low risk at 50 or above or if you're having you know issues so we do that we do know as dr newby had said earlier smoking is a risk factor for all diseases all so mm -hmm. we have to take that personal step and reduce as many of the risk factors as we can that way if there is a genetic component in there that we can't do anything about we don't try and help it along exactly um, but, but yeah, i, I want question. to try to get one more call in before we have to go gerald joins us from norfolk hi gerald you're on the air yeah, how you doing? Okay, you can turn your radio down and ask your question for us. Yeah, um, Dr. Newby talked about the correlation between um, uh, tobacco smoking and and the, and the diseases like uh, lung cancer, lung uh, uh, heart disease. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is is electronic cigarettes is that a substitute for um, the tobacco um, cigarettes? Um? Well, well we, I wouldn't say it was. A, it's, it's a substitute, but. I guess there's still the jury's out about, you know, exactly how that works. Be, um, because what's, what you're doing is water vapor, but you actually add nicotine to it. So, you know, part of the issue is, you know, you're, you're uh, and I guess the theory is that if you kind of have a way of putting less nicotine, you can kind of wean yourself off cigarettes. 
unfortunately, so yeah, I think one there was a Latif, I think they called from Hampton that was a mm-hmm. smoking cessation person. I mean, just like any other addiction, it's hard to do this on your own. I mean, I think you know you have to almost have a plan of how I'm going to do this, and you have to have a strong support system, you know, in place because that's one of the biggest. Uh, issues we have as medical physicians. I mean, I, I can't stay in, you know, have, I mean, I don't have the time or the resources to try to create these smoking cessation programs. And I feel bad because I don't always know all of how to help patients Somebody get off of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, because that is a true, strong addiction. So really, I think it can be helpful. It's just a matter of control. How are you going to control them? i tell you one thing real quickly, what I would be curious about. I've never actually looked this up as we were talking who owns the e-cigarette companies? I mean, if you really follow the trail Del of the Monte, money. Del Monte, can you answer that as we get yeah, wrap up yeah, our... Yeah, matter of fact, when the e-cigarette companies first came out, they were owned by independent contractors. And these folks actually used to make these claims that the e-cigarettes um, were a product that helped wean folks off of using uh, tobacco. But today, most of the e-cigarette companies have been bought up by the big three tobacco manufacturers. That's what I mean. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Follow that the money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mr. Del Monte Jefferson, Executive Director of the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network. Thank you so much for joining us, Del Monte. We really Thank appreciate you. you. Take you. care. <laughs> And Keith, I'm going to give, well, Frida, let me start with you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to say just something short that you want people to remember about smoking, about cancer. What should we be doing? Um, we should reduce our risk factors. And again, this is like Dr. Newby said, that this is something that you cannot do on your own. We have help out there. 1-800-ACS-2345. We have mentors that can help you guide through this. We want to reduce all cancers and create a world of more birthdays and less cancer. And that means that we do have to take accountability of our actions. Okay. That's Frida Bryan, Community Health Advisor, Associate Director with the American Cancer Society. Thank you so much Thank you for, for joining me. us. We appreciate that. Dr. Newby, you got the 30 seconds, the last 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I think the key thing, short of what Frida just mentioned, was um, we do have to target, I think, our, our um, like Ebony Magazine, some of these other um um, I guess magazines or media uh, devices that are advertising cigarettes. Mm-hmm. I mean, because really finding other means of advertising or, you know, these other companies that can advertise. I mean, you know, African American media, we are like the high spender of almost anybody in the world. So we can, we, I mean, you just find other companies and then we got to try. Like you said, follow the dollars. Yeah. That's cardiologist <laughs> Dr. Keith Newby. Thank you so much, Keith. And we will be right back. Hi, this is Essie Patha Merkerson from Law and Order. You are listening to Another View at 89.5 WHRV. How cool is that? Oh, Lisa Godley had a chance to interview Essie Pather Merkerson. She played Lieutenant Anita Van Buren on Law and Order. And people who know me know that is the, my favorite show on the planet. So I was so excited when that happened. Here's a little known piece of American history. There are hundreds of African-American classical music composers. And one of the most recognized and honored composers in the world lives right here in Hampton Roads. Some of you have probably already guessed who I'm talking about, but for those of you who haven't, you're about to meet Dr. Adolphus Hale Stork. Adolphus Hale Stork always wanted to be a musician and says he never considered doing anything else. By his early teens, he discovered a passion for something greater than playing. His new love was composing. When did you realize that this was your calling, that this is what you were destined to do? When I decided that I would prefer to make up pieces than to practice my scales and arpeggio, it was just so much fun to make up stuff. He's an award-winning, world-renowned composer who has written works for piano, organ, ensembles, bands, symphonies, and orchestras around the globe. Mm-hmm. 
One can only imagine the kind of feedback he gets from the many people whose lives he's touched through music. I was once involved in a lecture at the Library of Congress, and it was preceding a choir concert. A young lady walked up to me at an admission and said, I had your The Cloths of Heaven sung at my wedding because I just love that piece. And, and you know, I was very touched by that. The, my, my music is used for important human events, and it's not just resting on a show. And it's about to happen once more as part of the Virginia Arts Festival. Several Adolphus Hellstork pieces will be featured as part of the Remember and Rejoice, a sesquicentennial commemoration of the Civil War. The pieces, which he composed for chorus and brass, will be featured during an evening concert at the Attic's Theater. When I was coming along, um, I didn't have television, but I did have radio and would listen to all the dramatic stories. I mean, let's take something as simple as the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger background music was always classical music, and that included the famous uh, William Tell Overture. And I said, I want to write music like that. It's exciting, dramatic music. He says his favorite piece is always the one he's working on at the moment. And he shared a little of the backstory behind one of his most current compositions. I was very taken with the story of Mr. Fortune's Bones. Now, Mr. Fortune was a slave and his owner, after he died, extracted his bones, or at least quite a while after um, Mr. Fortune died. Finally, Mr. Fortune has been laid to rest. It's one of my pet themes to give attention and voice to the voiceless. And I thought that was a fantastic story. So I'm currently writing a piece for band that is uh, called The Bones of Mr. Fortune, just to pay homage to this slave that never would have been heard from except for this fantastic and slightly gruesome display. My job as composer is to reflect on the on trials and tribulations of our people in this country, but also to celebrate the great achievement and give voice to their hopes and dreams. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. The beautiful music of Dr. Adolphus Hale Stork. The concert featuring several of Dr. Hale Stork's works will take place this coming Monday, April 28th at 7.30 p.m. at Norfolk's Attics Theater. You can call the Virginia Arts Festival at 757-282-2822 for more information. And that's our show for today. If you like what you heard, please share our podcast with a friend. You can find it at anotherviewradio.org. And while you're there, sign up for our eView newsletter, a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. And don't forget, we're on Facebook, so be sure to like us. Next week, we turn our attention to our veterans as they adjust to civilian life after war. Join us for a preview of the new PBS documentary, Coming Back with Wes Moore. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Our audio engineer is Victor Bowen. And I'm so sorry I forgot the intern's name who answered the phones. I'm Bar- Denise Norris. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a great weekend, everyone. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.